Next up, we have an immersive generative AI experience hosted by our data science director, Josh Rubin. Over to you, Josh. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. Uh, super fun to get to kick off the, um, the workshop track. Um, so uh, without further ado, I will uh, kick over to my slides um, and tell you what this is all about. Uh, bear with me for just a moment. I have the classic too many windows problem. Awesome. Okay, so uh, this is what I this is where we're getting started. Great, great. So welcome to immersive Gen AI experience. Um, the subtitle is maybe a little bit more descriptive about what we're going to do. So uh, techniques from, from model visibility uh, and tracking change in data distributions. So, uh, you know, the way to think about this workshop is like, I'm trying to push a generative AI application into some sort of production setting. Um, you know, how do I keep track of and understand where it's doing well and not doing well and what might be changing in the world? Um, so uh, there is a link here for workshop materials. Don't worry about it right now. I'll flash another slide and Karen will share it for you when we get to the right part for that. So this is gonna be pretty interactive. Um, and she's under uh, you know, a request to uh, bring in questions as soon as they happen. So please interrupt me. This is you know, intended to be a, like a workshop where we're all sitting in a room together and asking questions and brainstorming. So you know, the more we can make the dialogue interactive, uh, the better. Um, and then finally, uh, you, we're going to use emojis. Like, uh, I'll, I need to know when you guys are done with the activity. Uh, you know, uh, encourage me when I've said something that resonates with you. Um, maybe we could all practice right now. Could you? Because I have no idea who's out there. It feels like I'm in a room by myself. Could you guys fire off some emojis, some reactions? Uh, you can use even the negative ones just for for uh, for fun. But I, I'd love to see a you know a thumbs up or an angry face or something, uh, so it doesn't feel quite so much like I'm in a, in a uh, conference room by myself. All right. I will proceed, but uh, do encourage me on with emojis. Um, awesome. So uh, the place we're gonna start is this statement that the generative models are different. Um, so the, you know, and, and different than what? Different than traditional ML models. Um, so, so the first point I'd like to make is that like feedback isn't built into your general generative AI applications. So, you know, in traditional ML, um, the models are functionally specific and they're trained for the specific task that uh, uh, where they're used. Um, so, you typically have a training label that either arrives automatically or you can choose to get some labeled data that's very closely aligned with your task. Um, for most of these Gen AI applications, uh, you know, you need to capture that feedback deliberately from our users or from other sources, um, because a lot of times these models are trained in a sort of semi-supervised fashion, like for LLMs, you know, they're trying to predict some next token and they're used in some fashion that's totally different from uh, the way that they're trained. So there isn't necessarily a natural label associated with the task that you're using them for. Um, Second point is uh, your input is unstructured and it's usually natural language, or maybe it's multimodal, maybe it's more than that. Um, so, uh, sorry, just glancing at the chat for a second. Um, oh, cool, cool. So, so the, the second point here is that, uh, you know, Input is unstructured, usually it's natural language. So, you know, for traditional structured ML, you know, if you have a model that's, for example, trying to make a credit lending decision for credit applicants, um, you know, we have these, you can, you can form these nice logical segments of the data by, you know, forming these logical uh, constraints on uh, some, some uh, you know, data segments. So you can say something like accuracy is low when the applicant's income is below this amount and geography is California. Right, and so within that little box in your structured space, you can score the model and, and answer questions about whether it's performing well or not. Um, for Gen AI, Gen AI um, we need to think a little bit more about the unstructured prompt space semantically. 
Um, and so this is where we start to use embeddings. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot about embeddings here, but um, you, you may be familiar. The idea is that you use some sort of model, some sort of language model or uh, in a, you know, a vision application. It can be a vision model, but that maps this unstructured data into some sort of um, uh, structured vector space where these vectors carry some of the semantics of the problem. So uh, the position in that vector space represents something about the meaning of that unstructured data. And you can compare those points together. Uh, and uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll leverage that a lot. So uh, I would ask you guys for questions. Feel free to throw more in the chat and Karen will let me know if uh, you know, there's any comments or, or thoughts about this. Cool, so uh, I think this is what I just said. Let's explore a workflow that addresses these concerns by integrating human feedback with language semantics to enable evaluation and diagnostics. All right, so we're almost to the interactive, uh, the first interactive part of the, of the workshop. Cool, so we've got this, uh, this activity and you're gonna be confronted with something that looks like the screen on the right side. Um, so uh, you're going to pretend like you work for a newspaper in this simulated AI application. Um, and your job is to use an AI image generator to create imagery for stories. So the first thing you'll see is something that looks like the top portion of the screen where you're given a newspaper section um, and you're given a couple of topics related to the story that you need an image for. Uh, and you're gonna create a prompt um, to generate that image. So this, this, this text field will be blank. I'm gonna walk you through one of these first. Um, so, uh, you know, I write a close-up photo of a woman with a large camera taking a picture of a marble bust in a museum, right? It's for the art section, who is a photographer, where is a museum? I have infused my own creativity into this to try to get a really good image for, for cause that's my job. Um, once you're given an image back, uh, so we kick that off to an AI image generator, you're going to have the option to provide some set of, uh, actually it's a requirement for the purpose of the workshop, uh, to, to provide some feedback on how well this generative AI process worked. Um, and uh, we, that's, that's really important for us to capture. So uh, there's questions like, how happy are you with the overall result? One through five. Fidelity, did the model capture everything you looked for? That's a yes, no Boolean question. Did the model make any assumptions that could indicate bias? Uh, and then feel free to optionally annotate this with you know, whatever comments you want about the, uh, the particular thing. Oh, it'll also ask you for your name. So down the road will be a, if you wanna see you know, where your results fell in the, um, the global analysis, you can pull up your, uh, your generations by name. So uh, all of this is gonna get captured so we can play with it afterwards. And then finally, I'm gonna ask you to do this 12 times each. So we're gonna pretend like we're doing this once a day for, uh, for 12 days. So there's a time component to this also that we'll, that we'll drill into in the second half of the, the workshop. And that, that's it. So you're gonna go through this little workflow like 12 times. So I'm gonna give you like 10 minutes to, to, to play this game. Um, so you know, we're gonna use this, just to recap, we're gonna use this generative AI to perform a simulated task and in each case provide feedback. So you can do the whole stack of these. And then we're gonna play the analysis game and try to learn what we can from um, exploring your feedback in the semantic space of the prompts. Awesome, okay. So I think we're ready for, for action here. You can uh, type gen-ai-workshop.fiddler.ai uh, gen -ai into your browser. Um, you can scan the QR code with your phone. I don't recommend doing it with the phone. It's a little cramped, but it is possible. Um, I think there's a workshop materials link you can click and that will take you directly to a link you can just click. Um, Thanks, Josh. So yep. I have put it in the link onto the chat as well and I'll turn it on, on the resources uh, feature of Zoom as well. There are some people who may, who are saying that it's taking a little bit too long mm -hmm. to respond. And- uh, For a second, I, let, let me, uh, so if I just switch right here and I load this thing, yeah, I'm getting pretty immediate response from this. Uh, I'm really sure, let me just like quintuple check that we've got the, the link right. Uh, right. Interesting. Okay, um, folks on it. folks on the call. Um, I posted a the link at ten fifty five a.m. Pacific. Can you try that and see? Oh, yes. 
the okay so one of our oh, um so it's http not https maybe we can we do a quick show of hands of who's where on this um so like give me a like a thumbs up or a thumbs down depending on uh how many of you have made it to the page and how many of you are still struggling so um just so that we are aware of time josh why don't you start with mm -hmm. the game um with the folks who are able to do it and then i'll um i'll work out with the, the rest right and not able to do it okay <laughs> cool cool yep um groovy okay i'm going to walk you through one of these um so you should find yourself Right. Okay. So you should find yourself when you just go to that URL on the landing page, which just recaps some of the stuff that I talked about and some of the stuff that's going to come up later in the talk. So there is a left ta uh, um, a left column where there's some different options. Oh, I'm seeing thumbs up now. This is great. Thanks for the feedback, you guys. Um, so uh, in this left column, you're going to click simulated Gen AI application. So don't worry about the, the, the analysis tabs are going to come later. Um, so here I'm going to walk through one of these. So the first thing I do is I put my name in. I'm Josh. Um, awesome. Okay, so the newspaper section that I'm creating this image for is uh, the travel section, and I'm supposed to uh, include uh, the prompt noodles and a hotel. So how about, um, uh, hi, quality photo of two people in white hotel bathrobes. Uh, eating noodles in a hotel room. Awesome. So I've infused my creativity into those prompts to try to get something good. I'm going to hit enter. It's going to kick this off to some image generation process somewhere in the cloud. Um, that might be Dolly 2. And yeah, this is awesome. This is exactly what I was looking for. So I get a goofy photo of people just lounging in their hotel room eating noodles. So I'm super happy with this. I don't need to mess with the feedback. Um, that's I would regard that as high fidelity. There was no problems here. Um, model didn't. I don't. I don't see anything regarding uh, bias here. And I would say like uh, for fun, love this one. And then I'm going to click submit. Uh, and if it works, you'll see a bunch of balloons fly across the screen. And uh, that's my job. So uh, you'll notice now we're on day two of 12. So uh, what I would like you folks to do is uh, follow the same workflow and do it 12 times. We're gonna spend 10 minutes and try to knock this out. And, uh, and then we'll circle back. So I'm gonna start a timer now. Uh, in about 10 minutes, I'll, I'll ask for, you know, thumbs or uh, ready to go. And uh, then we'll uh, think about the analysis part of the task. If there are any questions out there, feel free to fling them into the chat. Um, otherwise, uh, go to it and get your 12 days of work done.
this is awesome, you guys. We're only like three minutes in and I'm already seeing like 60 responses. So so keep at it. Uh, I've done this a few times, but this uh, the, the more data we have, the better this works. And, uh, you know, I think this is... Uh, Potentially, our, our the, the the best the best run of this ever. So, uh, uh, yeah, keep it up. Josh, do you want to uh, share your Streamlit um, game on the screen? Um, well, we're so we're at half time. Um, okay. I, uh, I mean, I can show the static screen, but uh, right now, mostly people should be uh, pushing more more records into it. Um, so yeah, so I, sh I should we should have a pretty picture of something uh, available to stare at, but. Um, yeah, I think it's best if we just all stay focused on our task for the moment. Got it. Okay. And we're over halfway. We only have about three or four minutes left. Okay. If you guys have made it through all 12, why don't you give a thumbs up on the reaction? And if you'd like a little more time, uh, why don't you give a, um, why don't you give a, uh, a, like a, I don't know, the, uh, the O face, the face of astonishment. Okay, good. I'm seeing more time. Oh, lots of faces of astonishment. Yeah, keep at it. Hopefully this is working for everybody. Uh, we did try to crank up the capacity on the app in case, you know, we were overrun with, with hundreds of participants. So. Um, hopefully it's working well for you. Although there are some aspects of it that are, it's a, it's a sort of prototype app, right? There's some things that are a little bit slow. Um, oh, I saw another O face. I'm seeing a lot more O faces than thumbs up. So we need, yeah, we need the rest of the time. Very cool. We're over 200 records now, but do do try to get yourself all the way to 12 because uh, we'll play with the time dependence also after.
You guys are crushing it. Oh, I see a thumbs up. Looking good, you guys. I got one more minute on the clock. If you guys want that, uh, oh, lots of thumbs up. This is great. Thank you guys for being so engaged. This is like, uh, this is the, I, I've run this workshop with a big group once before and it was a similar activity. And we've now uh, totally beaten that version in terms of uh, number of responses. So hopefully we get a good outcome from it. But who knows? Uh, uh, you know, real-time activity. It always comes off the rail somewhere. Any more O-faces out there? Oh, great celebration. I love it. Super excited. Killer. Okay, 20 seconds to go. Yeah, thanks a ton, everybody. There's my timer. Okay, we've done it. I don't see any more O faces, so let's let's carry on. Uh, I'll show my face again. Okay, yeah, thank you. That that's fantastic. Um, I see uh, right now 262 records, uh, which is which is super cool. Um, let me just share my screen here. Um, right. Okay. So let's talk about uh, what we just did. Cool. Okay, so, so the idea here is we're implementing a concept that we're calling, you know, or that people call feedback controls uh, for generative AI applications, right? So you have just participated in some simulated uh, gen AI application, um, and uh, you submitted a prompt, right? And uh, you gave that to a generative model, and it gave you an image, um, a photo of a professor walking a dog. Uh, and, and then you provided some feedback to that model, right? So we're gonna, we gathered some human feedback built into that part of the process. And, and honestly, if there's a theme to this workshop, it's, um, you know, your responsibility is if you're developing generative AI apps is to really capture as much feedback as you can. Um, don't, don't neglect to that because that's, that's your key to understanding how well your, your application is operating. Now, here's what was happening in the background while you were doing that. Um, that prompt went to an embedding model that turned it into a, a, a vector that represented the semantics of the thing you asked for, or the human level meaning. It went through a dimensionality reduction algorithm. So we're using UMAP in this case, um, that'll convert that to a lower dimensional representation. And what we're about to do is look at that on a graph. Um, so, uh, and, and so we're gonna take this feedback and we're gonna overlay it on this semantic map of the things that you asked for. And the idea then is uh, that will help you identify problematic clusters uh, that have some sort of useful commonality. So say we have possible bias, we tag possible bias because it picked a male professor. Um, now, uh, you know, here that, you know, gets fed into this little clump of semantically similar prompts. And so being able to look at it in this semantic view gives you the ability to identify, you know, potentially potential failure modes that have, have useful semantic commonality. And so by drilling into these particular examples, you can see we get a photo of a pilot with a cat, a photo of a professor walking a dog, a portrait of a CEO with a falcon, which is my favorite. Um, you know, again, all, all maybe bias. This is an obviously concocted uh, example, but um, that's the gist of what we've tried to do here is reproduce this kind of workflow. And I think this is like sort of best practice for, you know, um, your, your Gen AI applications. Um, again, we're merging that semantic view, which restores the, um, you know, gives structure to the unstructured input with, with feedback. 
Okay, so I've beaten that horse. Let's jump and see what we did. Oh, let me out. Awesome. Okay, so uh, you're welcome to go to tab as the second the, the analyzing our feedback section of the thing, or we can just talk through this. I can. I'm happy to just uh, take us all through this. Um, bear with me for one second. Oops. Come on, application. Here we go. All right, 278 records. Uh, and, you know, again, live demo or live demonstration, you're never guaranteed to know how it works, uh, that, that it's going to gonna do exactly what you want it to. Um, so the first thing we're looking at, you can see here on the left, uh, here's everybody who's participated. It's awesome to see so many names. Thank you, guys. Um, and... Uh, and on the right side, where it's the color scheme. So you can either overlay the newspaper section or the, for example, the quality parameter. We can we can lay here to say, ask questions about, you know, are there any prompt semantics that correspond to particularly bad performance of the model as graded by the human uh, stakeholder? Um, so if I look at the newspaper section, this is sometimes the, the UMAP uh, uh, transformation is not always totally stable. So as we add another record, sometimes it flips the whole thing around. So during certain portions of your uh, your activity, it was really nicely distributed with, with some clumps. But um, you can sort of see, if you squint your eyes a little bit, like here's a blob of brown that sort of corresponds to the arts section, or at least some particular set of topics in the arts section. And up here is a blob of blue that corresponds to sports. Here are some tight little pockets of purple. That is the cartoon section. So, you know, back to your kind of semantics at work, right? It, the structure of this plot knows nothing about, um, uh, you know, which section it came from, that, the, the, the clustering. And, and as I said before, sometimes this comes out really nicely clustered. This is kind of like uh, a little meh. Um, but uh, the clustering that is happening here is determined entirely from the prompts that you've entered. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at uh, fidelity and see if there were any like clumps where we got a bunch of bad results and see if we can learn something. I did try to hide an Easter egg in here. We'll see if we can find it. Um, so let's look at this little little tail down here. Oh, by the way, you can click on any of these. So you can also you can select your name if you want to just see what what your uh, what you did. But um, you can click on any of these points. So let's just click, you know, this, this random positive feedback one here, you know, and here we had Sanjay had a newspaper section business, a shipping container workers, workers loading the container into a large ship on the deck of the ocean in the background in the container yard. Awesome. This worked great for you. Uh, glad to hear it. Um, so then we're going to look for, you know, uh, regions where the model uh, made its users unhappy. Um, so I don't know, this looks like it could be a sort of, fail cluster down here, but I'm not sure. Let's see what happened. Tomorrow in Streamlit app, AWS backend, go. Oh, interesting. Uh, oh, so the user prompt was an art gallery and, and no, not an art gallery. Um, let's try another one of these. <laughs> I love this AI generated text. Uh, a scandal. A leader of NATO has a scandal and got fired. Uh, yeah, looks like uh, Taro didn't love this one. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Let's see if we can find a, a clump where maybe we got something uh, informative. Sorry, this uh, this app does a little caching thing where every thirty seconds it tries to reload the whole data set. Uh, NATO membership in Romania. Uh, yeah, this is another case where it's kind of just like not not particularly exciting. Bear with me for a second. I really want to find the. Oh, here's one. Okay, so uh, right. So user generated prompt: a high quality close up photo of a woolly dog walking along a dusty road in a road, road in a village. Uh, okay. Um, uh, so this is obviously not a dog. Um, where did I find this one? Let's see if we actually got like a cluster of the dog cat problem. So, so okay, the thing we're supposed to find here that, you know, 
sometimes stands out really well and doesn't always stand out really well is uh, I was swapping dogs and cats in the prompt. So you should get, uh, you know, you may have encountered, uh, you know, pet prompts that did something weird. Uh, anyway, so maybe this isn't the most slam dunk example, but, you know, live demo. Um, hmm. I would love to find one more of these. Anyway, ideally you get a clump of uh, cat dog swap pictures, but uh, somehow it didn't it didn't wash out that well this time. Cool. Okay, so we're at eleven seventeen in my time. Um, let's jump to the second topic because I think we have uh, about ten more minutes, uh, which is time dependence. Um, any questions there? There is one that came in. Do you want to? Yeah, I'll I'll say it. Sure. Are are the dimensions driven by the generated images or the input prompts? Are the dimensions driven by the generated images or the input prompts? Uh, the all of the embedding and dimensionality reduction stuff is performed on the input, but it's the embedding. If this is the question that the, the question you're asking. The dimensionality of the embedding um, is actually determined by the embedding model and not by the prompt. So whatever the model is, it should be producing vectors on all prompts that are the same, uh, the same length. Feel free to follow up if that wasn't quite, quite, the, uh, quite the question. Oh, and here's another question. What kinds of actions can you take if problematic, pro problematic regions are identified? Um, you know, in some, in some generative AI cases, that can be, you know, you could imagine in a, in a scenario where you have an application for, um, you know, uh, retrievable augmented generation. I maybe jump, I don't know if Karen, you were gonna save this one, this question for a little bit later. I started reading the Q and A. Um, you know, oh no, go ahead, go ahead. In a scenario with retrieval augmented generation, not that that's this, this particular scenario, um, you know, you might uh, supplement your database. You know, it may be that you have a dearth of information on a topic that your users care about a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, in that scenario, you may want to supplement with, uh, you know, additional data. So, so like one, one example is um, we have a banking customer who has a chat bot. Uh, so this is an anecdote we got in real life from this customer. And, you know, that chat bot was, uh, you know, not, not particularly well prepared for a whole bunch of queries that happened all of a sudden on the Silicon Valley bank collapse. Um, so people started asking about the security of their savings with the bank, They're totally unrelated to Silicon Valley Bank, or about FDIC insurance. And that chatbot didn't have enough information to pull on about that particular topic. Um, so, you know, in that scenario, you might identify that there's a cluster of unhappy customers with a common sort of question um, and, uh, you know, supplement the, uh, the, the data store that the model is pulling on um, with some additional responses to respond to those, to, to you know, better cover things that your users want. Um, another remediation would be to build kind of uh, geofencing into your, into your application. So if there is a particular kind of query, you might just want to have a boilerplate answer that your model comes back with and says, uh, you know, um, sorry, uh, this particular topic is, you know, uh, isn't something I can answer. Uh, is there anything else I can help you with? Rather than, you know, really flubbing the answer or providing really unsatisfactory feedback. Um, so, so those are a couple of, a couple of ideas for, for how you might, might handle that sort of situation. Um, let, let's jump to the next topic here and we can circle back at the end if there's time and, and I'll address more of the questions. So, um, this part is called, uh, measuring drift and unstructured data. So, um, another really key piece of this is, you know, that evaluating model performance requires feedback. Uh, and but but feedback isn't always available immediately. Sometimes that that signal is delayed, um, and you need to know if something is changing on the ground. Like in that banking example I just gave, um, responsible AI practice is knowing about changes in the world that might impact your model's performance as soon as possible, uh, because otherwise you're you know leaving you know potentially revenue on the table, or you know uh, your model might be doing something mission critical and underperforming could be dangerous. Um, for models with unstructured inputs, the embedding vectors, as I've talked about, that's your key to tracking semantic shifts um, for which your model might not be prepared. And so let me describe to you quickly the vector monitoring approach that Fiddler uses. Um, you know, in your own applications, you could implement something similar. Um, 
but uh, you know, so how can we identify changes in vector distribution? So these are again sort of embedding semantic plots. In this case, we're just looking at two-dimensional embeddings just as schematically. So, so the question we're trying to answer here is at some initial time where you have some data distribution in that embedding space, how do you know if the, the data distribution has changed? So at some time one, you have a visibly different distribution of data. Um, something has changed in the world that's um, important and you'd like a signal that can send you an alert if this occurs. And so what we do at Fiddler is um, we use k-means in this space. It's an algorithm, a very simple algorithm for clustering to partition up the, the embedding space. So those little stars represent the means of um, the cluster centroids. And then we count the number of events, the number of data that are closest to each of those centroids. And we turn that into a histogram. So you can see there's a, a lot of blue ones and not so many of the turquoise ones, and then a lot of the kind of maroon ones. At some subsequent time period, we apply that same set of cluster centroids. So we do what we call a sketch in this thing. Um, and then we measure the distribution of proximity to those centroids on that initial basis. And what you can see is you get a different histogram out, right? So what we've done is partitioned up the space and done this sort of crude density estimate of how many points are in each of those regions. Um, we can compare those two histograms and there are information theoretic sort of uh, calculations you can do like the Jensen-Shannon distance you know, when that number is zero, when the distributions are identical, when that number gets closer to something like one, when those, when those distributions are different. There's also things like population stability index that's really popular in financial services. Um, so that number is something that you can track. Uh, and so here, here's something from a blog. There's a link to the blog also in the activity that you've done. Um, and uh, this is the Jensen-Shannon distance, and we are looking at embeddings using one of OpenAI's, the, the Auto2 embedding model, which is pretty fabulous. Um, and uh, we're looking at that sort of Jensen-Shannon distance over time. So like I told you, when it was close to zero, that represents um, very similar distributions. There's some reference that's taken at this time zero. And we're going to synthetically manipulate the composition of the... Um, uh, these news group data that are streaming into the system. And what you can see is if you look at just science and religion, that suddenly you get this big semantic shift that you can measure this way. If you look at just religion, it pushes all the way up here. It's really totally different than the all groups distribution of text. Uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but this is the, the, the sort of canonical 20 news groups data set. You can download this through scikit-learn. Um, so what you can see is this is actually quite a sensitive measure to uh, semantic shifts in data. Um, we have a blog on this. You should check it out. Um, Cool, so let's see how this worked on our data. So as I may have uh, insinuated, um, the distribution was changing during those 12 questions that you answered. So there were four questions, the initial four questions were drawn from distribution A. The middle four questions were drawn from a slightly different distribution. And that all is getting rendered in your prompts, right? And uh, the last four questions are from the, uh, a th uh, back from the first distribution. So the middle four were dissimilar to the first four. So here, you can go here if you want in the application. I'm just gonna walk you through it. I can choose three, four, or five bins. You can see here, these are the prompts one through four in that same embedding space. Here's five through eight and nine through 12. And I've written modified here just to let you know that that's where the, that's, that's the, the underlying thing that you'd be trying to detect. Um, and they get carved up using k-means into these, into these different bins. Here are the histograms for each of each of those bins. Um, you might actually be able to see with your eye that uh, the middle section is is more different than uh, the blue or the green. Um, and then down here, we're going to plot the Jensen Shannon distance. And uh, yeah, and so this isn't quite the slam dunk again that it, it sometimes is. Let's try a different number of bins. Um, I don't know. That looks a little bit more assertive. But what you can see here is in both cases. Prompts five through eight have a larger Jensen-Shannon distance. Um, so there's more, there, there's a data drift, you know, relative to this, uh, you know, initial point, right? This is larger, and that is indicating that those middle prompts were uh, different from prompts one through four. So I should probably read the plot label. Distributional comparison with prompts one through four. That's why you don't see one through four here. So nine through 12 is more similar to one through four than five through eight is. Um, you know, and we've measured that just using the prompts that you guys all generated and the embeddings from those prompts. And so, you know, if there is a semantic shift that could be important, you'd love to be able to um, 
you know, send an alert on that that goes to your email as a model developer. You'd like to understand if things are changing in the world so you can react to that quickly. Um, cool. So I, I think I'm trying to leave a minute for a question, but uh, let me just quick with takeaways. Embedding, rep, re, embedding vectors are your key to understanding unstructured space. Um, feedback of one kind or another is really important. Um, and then, you know, uh, here's the shameless fiddler plug. Uh, we have a comprehensive platform that addresses these challenges at scale um, for customers with large and diverse model portfolios and sometimes in mission critical applications. Great. So that's what I wanted to tell you about. We have, I think, two minutes or something. If, uh, Karen, is there a question that that looks interesting? Yes, there is a question. Um, the question is, what happens when the human reviewing the data provides incorrect feedback? That's a really good question. Um, and, and that's a thing that happens. And I think, you know, I think that's the value of being able to aggregate this data kind of um, like one of the reasons why it's important to get a lot of data, right? So you can say something statistical about a cluster. You can say, okay, here's a blob where like at some point that unless, you know, your humans are providing, you know, a lot of um, adversarial feedback, they're really trying to mess up your, uh, your process. Generally the spurious stuff kind of washes out. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at a cluster, if you see something where there's a lot of problematic responses that are associated with, with semantics, usually that's not from just a few uh, incorrect feedback points, but probably looking at individual, you know, uh, you could have noisy signal just looking at it as you, as you point out from incorrect feedback, if you're just looking at individual anecdotes. Great, thank you so much, Josh.